Hi, welcome to Pathology Riddles. Today, we are going to deal with this topic called as cervical cancer. In order to understand about cervical carcinoma, we need to remember a little anatomy of the uterus. So this, imagine that this is the uterus which I'm drawing. So it might not be a perfect figure but it's a line diagram. So at these two ends, that is this side as well as this side, we have the fallopian tubes. Then the elevated portion on top is the fundus. And then we will draw the body of the uterus. This is the body of the uterus. And then we have the cervix. So at the end of the cervix, we will have the opening. And this is the ectocervix. We have the ectocervix and we have the endocervix. The ectocervix is surrounded by the vagina. So inside the body, we will have the endometrial cavity. The endometrial cavity will continue downwards as the endocervical canal. So if we see the lining of the vagina, it is mainly the stratified squamous epithelium. And the lining of the ectocervix is also this stratified squamous epithelium. Now there will be one portion above where the ectocervix and the endocervix joins and that portion will have from that portion the endocervix will have the columnar epithelium. So here is where the squamous epithelium ends and where the columnar epithelium starts that is somewhere around where the internal os is present. So at that place, there will be some amount of immature squamous epithelium. So why is it important to remember this junction of squamous and columnar? This is because this immature squamous epithelium uh, is very susceptible for infection by human papilloma virus. And human papilloma virus, the high risk variants are the causative organisms of cervical cancer. So it is important to know about this zone. This zone is called as transformation zone. Okay, so we have the place where the squamous epithelium and columnar epithelium meet. At that area, there is a lot of immature squamous epithelium which is called as the transformation zone. Another point to remember is usually this human papilloma virus cannot enter an intact epithelium except when there is a break or an ulcer. So that is how it can go to other parts of the epithelium and transformation zone, it is easy for it to enter because the immature squamous epithelium is readily available. So that's about the anatomy. Now, why is it important to learn about cervical cancer? It is important to learn about cervical cancer because a few decades back, the cervical cancer was the main reason or the most common cancer in the world to have cancer related deaths. And now it has become the third most common. So from the most common to third most common, it has occurred mainly because of the screening procedure called as pap smear. The pap smear helps in early detection of the cervical cancers and helps us to treat the patient at a very early stage and to prevent the deaths related to cervical cancer. Now let's learn what are the risk factors of cervical cancer. So the most important risk factor is early age at first intercourse. 
so if it is early they have a prolonged exposure to the human papilloma virus then multiple sexual partners one of them who is infected will be able to transfer the human papilloma virus high risk variant and male partner with multiple previous sexual partners they will also expose that particular female with human papilloma virus strains and persistent infection by high risk strains of papilloma virus so these are the main risk factors that lead to cervical cancer so which are the high risk types high risk types are mainly type 16 and 18 there are the hpv or the human papilloma virus is mainly type based on their dna sequence so we need to remember that uh, 16 hpv type 16 accounts for majority of the cases followed by hpv type 18 and the rest of the types the high risk types account for very uh, very less number of cases and then we have the low low risk type which are 6 and 11 usually they are found in benign lesions like condyloma so what is the pathogenesis first of all we need to know that once the hpv goes into the immature cells of the transformation zone then it will go into the nucleus of the cervical epithelial cells once it integrates it will produce two proteins one is e6 and e7 so what does e7 do e7 will bind to rb1 gene and p53 and inactivate them so basically there are tumor suppressor genes when the tumor suppressor gene is inactivated then it can lead to uncontrolled cellular proliferation along with this they also prevent the ability of those cells to repair the dna so that is also a contributing factor for the formation of cancer cells and then what does e6 protein do it increases the telomerase expression i'm sure you have gone through the cellular aging video in that we have spoken about telomeres right telomeres are uh, present at the ends of the chromosomes so usually whenever there is uh, multiplication that telomere becomes shorter and shorter and when it is so short that it is not able to help in replication then it will signal apoptosis and the cell will die usually some of the germ cells have got this telomerase whenever telomerase is there it will keep adding to the ends of the chromosomes it will keep adding the telomeres so when it keeps adding in the cancer cells what will happen is the cancer cells will become immortal and they will be able to multiply many number of times so e6 proteins increases telomerase expression and e7 will inactivate all these tumor suppressor genes so that's how it contributes to cervical cancer so it's important to know about pap smear so this screening procedure mainly uh, is done when the patient enters opd and uh, usually when they are in the reproductive age group and they come with this symptoms or for a general checkup so we started from the age of 21 it can be done every 3 years and if it is negative for any changes and negative for hpv then at the age of 30 years we do it once in 5 years so how do we do the pap smear mainly the patient is put in this lithotomy position and then uh, that is the back is lying on the bed and the legs are kept at the sides folded at the sides then the gynecologist will use a speculum and they will dilate the cervix a little and uh, a cervical brush will be taken and it will be moved in a circular position around the transformation zone these cells will be transferred to a slide and then we spread the smear following which the pap stain is done and then we visualize it under the microscope so it is evaluated whether it is satisfactory for evaluation or unsatisfactory it is based on the number of cells sometimes we give it satisfactory but limited whenever there is lot of inflammation which is obscuring the visibility of the cells inflammation or hemorrhage and sometimes we give it unsatisfactory when the required number of cells are not seen under the microscope 
then we can divide it into different categories based on whether the lesion is in the glandular cells or whether it is in the squamous cells. Usually broadly we give it as ASCUS. ASCUS means atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance or low grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions and squamous cell carcinoma. We can so how do we diagnose CIN1, CIN2 and CIN3? So first of all know what is CIN1 that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Mainly it is there in the epithelium. So if this is the basement membrane, then we will divide the epithelium into three parts. The lowermost part that is close to the epithelium, the second part which is above the lower part and the topmost part. So remember that if it involves only the lowermost part, then it is CIN1. Abnormal cells extend up to one third thickness from the basal to the surface layer. This much. Then if it involves up to two thirds, then it is CIN2. And if it involves full thickness, it is CIN3 or carcinoma in C2. So next what we need to know is mainly about the cervical cancer. How does that appear on cross? So they can be fungating or ulcerating. Fungating means uh, it will look more like cauliflower like growth. And ulcerating is a break in the epithelium. It will be fungating or ulcerating and infiltrating means it will go into the deeper layers. It will start that way and then slowly it will go either downwards towards the vagina or and the sideways to the rest of the uterus and then to the pelvic wall, then to the surrounding structures that is urinary bladder, rectum, vagina and regional lymph nodes. And finally, there will be distant metastasis to lungs, liver, bone marrow and the kidneys. So the most common of these is the squamous cell carcinoma. And then we have the adenocarcinoma and finally neuroendocrine, adenosquamous and various other types of carcinomas can occur in the cervix. Then we have the staging. In stage 0 mainly it is carcinoma in C2. In stage 1 it is confined to the cervix. And then we have the subtypes based on how deep it is invading. Stage 2 is mainly it is beyond the cervix but it does not go to the pelvic wall. It involves the vagina but not the lower third of the vagina. In stage 3, it has extended to the pelvic wall and on rectal examination, there is can no cancer-free space between the tumor and the pelvic wall. The tumor involves the lower third of the vagina. And in stage 4, it has extended beyond the pelvis, true pelvis and has involved the mucosa of the bladder or rectum. It can also disseminate in other places. So that's all about uh, cervical cancer. If you have any doubts, do write to us so we can address you. This is Dr. Susan signing out till we meet in the next video.